In addition to presenting him with an honorary degree, it's also my great privilege to welcome Victor Hamill to serve as this year's primary commencement speaker. Mr. Hamill's outstanding business successes and his exemplary service to numerous community organizations makes him an excellent choice to address the graduates of Albright College, and we're most grateful for his presence here today. I'm delighted to share that Victor Hamill had an Albright College connection even before today. He was a cousin to the late Richard J. Yashik, for whom an annual lecture at Albright College is named and presented in, conjun in conjunction with the Edwin and Alma N. 51 Lakin Holocaust Library and Resource Center. Mr. Hamill is also a member of the Albright Community Leaders Advisory Council and a good friend. As Dr. Saburi has noted, Mr. Hamill has been an influential figure in his industry. Equally significant, he has contributed much to our community. He is the immediate past chair and a 25-year board member of Reading Health Systems, a co-founder of the Burks Alliance, a former president and current development committee member of the Jewish Federation of Reading, past president of the Greater Burks Food Bank, a board executive committee member of Yemen Ore Youth Village, Mount Carmel, Israel, and fundraising campaign co-chair along with his wife, Dina, for Penn State Burks, among many other commitments. We are privileged to have such an esteemed figure join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Victor Hamill. Thank you. Well, President Mellon, faculty, administrators, family and friends of the graduates, and especially those of you who are graduating, congratulations on this very significant achievement. Thank you for the honor of addressing you on this very special occasion, and certainly for the honorary degree from Albright. It is a high honor to receive it, and for the kind words, Dr. Zaburi and Dr. McMillan. I don't think there's ever been anything more complimentary said about me since I overheard my mother bragging about me to a friend. I feel for particularly fortunate to have the opportunity to be with you as Dr. McMillan is rightfully running his victory laps on what has been an extremely successful tenure as president of Albright. And I'm a businessman, not an educator, so I'll take this off for a minute. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge and thank President McMillan for a couple of initiatives that go beyond his daily leadership of the college. Albright has always been a very important institution of Reading and Berks County. Under Lex, this has been enhanced in many ways. One example, because of President McMillan, Albright is a co-founder and investor of the Berks Alliance, a newly formed organization of the key anchor institutions of Berks County, whose purpose is to look at our community needs over the next decade and to provide leadership to assure that our private and public institutions are working together to make Berks an even better place to live and work. Albright will have its rightful place in helping to provide that vision, thanks to Dr. McMillan. I'm also grateful to Albright for its long-term and continuing commitment to the Lake and Holocaust Library, with, which Lex, Lex just mentioned, with its related courses and programs. While this is a partnership with the Jewish Federation of Reading, based initially on the Holocaust that took the lives of six, six million Jews during World War II, it focuses today on worldwide human rights and genocide. I have a personal connection to this, which Lex mentioned, it, based on my cousin who was, uh, whose family perished uh, at the hands of the Nazis. Dr. McMillan has not only given Albright's institutional support to this Holocaust program, but he and Dottie have sponsored receptions and attended just about every program during his tenure. Thank you, Dr. McMillan and Dottie. I recall my own graduation from Penn State. It was a day of great, a great day of celebration with family and friends. Although I, I do remember who the commencement speaker was, I don't remember one thing he said. So I recognize where this speech may fit in your day. My personal goal is to provide you with the reverse experience of mine, that you'll actually remember one or two things I've said but it will be perfectly okay if you completely forget who the speaker was. As my first possible takeaway, let me share with you my preferred method of passing on ideas and concepts. It's through stories and anecdotes. When the purpose of a speech is to educate or train, you're compelled to have an orderly 
and structured approach, like the seven issues that led to World War I, or the five goals your company needs to have for increasing profitability. In 2016, that is generally accomplished by the ubiquitous PowerPoint presentation, which I often use myself. But when I'm trying to share values, I feel the concepts stick better through stories and anecdotes if I tell them right. The risk is that I may wander a bit and lose you on the way. Well, let's see how this works out today. Lex, when you asked me to speak a few months ago, you emphasized the value of experience and encouraged me to share my experiences. When I began thinking about this speech in early November, we were about to have a presidential election. Lex's comments resonated with me because one of the candidates was portrayed as the most experienced person to ever run for president. But like many others who are learning to adapt to the unexpected, I've had to make adjustments to this speech as a result of the election outcome. Instead, I now have the dubious opportunity to emphasize the importance of flexibility with a significant twist on the concept of experience. You had to be flexible today to have this change from morning to afternoon. When our country was facing the most critical time in its history, we elected a highly experienced candidate for president who had been both Secretary of State and the United States Senator. Of course, you know I'm referring to the election of 1856, when our nation was even more divided than we are today on the issue of slavery. We elected James Buchanan, who was and still is the most experienced person to ever run for president. He had also been Secretary of State and a United States Senator from my beloved state of Pennsylvania, as a po and he did it longer than Hillary Clinton did for the, as a United States Senator from New York. Buchanan also served in Congress for 11 years, plus he was Ambassador to Great Britain and Ambassador to Russia. Regrettably, Buchanan is also deemed by most historians to be the worst president we ever had. Chief among his deficiencies is the fact that about 90 days after his presidency, the Civil War began, the war that claimed the lives of more Americans than all our future wars combined. Plus, our country almost ceased to exist as the United States. So, Lex, I think we're going to have to face the reality that career experience is not the sole predictor of success. Perhaps we need to view experience as a more than just resume accomplishment. Most of you are looking for, and with your valuable Albright degree, you have or will find good positions, but they are likely to be entry-level jobs where you will work with more experienced people. Yes, you must first learn about the organization and your own job responsibilities, but don't assume that you have little to contrib contribute because you lack specific job experience. After a year, years here at Albright, you do have valuable experience. To get to this day, you have likely developed a high level of observation, inquisitiveness, and questioning skills. Plus, about a week ago, I had the great pleasure of meeting about a dozen of you and learned firsthand about the variety of sacrifices you made to become a graduate no small accomplishment. In the hope that you will work for a good organization, they will welcome your fresh outlook and your questions about why they do or don't do certain things. So I can encourage you to begin the next phase of your life with the confidence and the experience you do have. And particularly as you gain experience, succeed and climb the ladder of your organization, be sure you're open to ideas from people junior to you. In my organization, I made it a practice to speak to coworkers about six months after they joined our company. And I learned a lot from them. Two of my favorite questions were, what is different from our company than what you anticipated when you first accepted employment? And if you could change one thing about the company, what would it be? When I attended the Harvard Business School, well, maybe I should stop a minute and for honesty and full disclosure. I did attend the Harvard Business School for about three weeks, where the entrance requirements for the course were pretty much limited to your willingness to pay the exorbitant tuition and take three weeks off from your job. 
I'm going to skip the standard commencement speech advice about the importance of lifelong learning. Consider the fr considering the frequency with which you've had to deal with technology, I'm going to assume you know that. But I did learn a few valuable things and a piece of advice I disagreed with then and now. The advice was, do not fall in love with your business or career. The professor wanted to emphasize that you should have a balanced life and not be obsessed with work. Also, for those who owned a business, that you should not be so in love with it that you could not sell it when that might become the best option for the future of your company and your organization. But my primary disagreement with him is that I believe it is critical to find a career that you can love. Of course, not with the same type of love you have for your family, but think of this, you will likely spend one half or more of your life's waking hours doing something connected to your career. Think about that. I don't see how it's possible to be successful working on something for which you don't have passion. And as a result of that passion and a career that invigorates, you'll be a more upbeat, energized kind of person. To state that in the negative, by accepting work just because it might pay more, you risk becoming someone who is cynical, disgruntled, and not a very good role model if you have children. So I hope you will be fortunate to find a career that is meaningful to you and that you can work for a company or institution that you can be proud of while also finding a proper balance. Maybe you've heard of this aphorism. If you do something you love, you'll never actually work a day in your life. Now here's one of the concepts I learned and I do use frequently. It was a case study of the banking industry. In the early 1970s, a large bank ran a series of focus groups to determine what level of service was needed to satisfy their customers doing routine work. They asked the focus groups questions like, how many people are, willing to st are you willing to stand behind in, in line without being annoyed? The answer was four. That meant that the bank didn't have to provide staff to make sure that the line was just one or two or three. What type of personal conversation would you like from that teller? Just a courteous hello, perhaps a bit of idle chit chat or more? As a result of these and other questions, the bank developed staffing plans and developed customer service training for programs for banks, uh, for, for the tellers. But they made a serious error in their questionnaire design. They asked questions to get answers of issues of interest to the bank, but they did not ask the customer in-depth questions to determine what the customer really wanted, which is the true definition of marketing. Had they done so, they would have learned that the customer wanted none of that. No lines, no chit-chat of any type. The customer saw routine banking as transactional, not relational. Another bank asked the right kinds of questions and developed a new device called the ATM machine. Vastly reduced lines and zero chit-chat. Come to think of it, I guess none of you have ever been alive without ATM machines. If I get invited back, uh, Lex, to make another speech, I'll enthrall you with my memories of the early days of the telephone. So from this ATM story, a standard commencement speech might be, be open to new ideas. But what I'm passing on to you is not to simply ask questions your, of your customers, your coworkers, or your children, but be sure you're asking the right questions. This is a trickier business than you might think. Henry Ford, the automaker, said that if he had asked his prospective customers what they wanted, they would have said, make me a faster horse. And to take this one level deeper and to offer you another possible takeaway, consider the basic act of doing. How many of your parents have said something like, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right? I know I heard that from my parents and I've said it to my children. Do the thing right. But it's even more important to first determine if you're about to do the right thing. In many cases, the answer to determining what the right thing to do is not found in data or from focus groups, but may require deep personal reflection. Before telling you the next story, I'm going to give you in advance the takeaway. Don't take yourself too seriously. The part of my job as company CEO that I enjoyed the most was visiting our branch offices. And I think the coworkers look forward to them too, or at least I've convinced myself they did. The business agenda for a full day was arranged so that I would speak to virtually every coworker 
in small groups. Part of the schedule was that I'd come in the evening before and have dinner with five or six of the people who were in, made up the local management team. It was primarily a social event, and attendance was voluntary, although most did attend. At one of these dinners in Pittsburgh, I was told that two of the supervisors would not, would not be there. No problem. The next morning, Frank and Herman, actual names, uh, sheepishly apologized to me for not being at dinner. I sincerely said it was perfectly OK. The dinners are voluntary. They obviously felt that they needed to provide more of an excuse. They explained they had tickets to the Pirates game. I repeated that I understood, and it was really OK. Frank seemed particularly embarrassed and then said, Vic, you know, I would normally have given up the Pirates tickets to be with you, but you know, it was bobblehead night. So the lesson learned, you may become important in your organization, but remember you're not the most important person in your coworkers' lives. They have families and friends more important than you. In fact, you're likely not even as important as bobblehead night. So take your job seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I feel one of my best traits, which has helped me, is my instinct, my instinct to plan for the near and distant future. And this has been a habit long before I heard the widely used quote from hockey player Wayne Gretzky, who said, maybe some of you have heard of this, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it has been. For example, if I worked for Albright, I'd pro I'm the type of person that would probably be sitting here thinking, what can we do to make this commencement even better next spring? Although I'm extremely impressed with your staff's attention to detail, especially with the nimbleness with which they handled this change. But I'd still be looking for improvements for the future and possibly some, missing some of this scintillating speech. When I'm on family vacation, I'm the one always thinking about what activity we might do tomorrow. But in the process, I must admit, I'm likely to miss some of the pleasures of the present. So here's the takeaway. Even your best trait if taken to an extreme, can become a weakness. After speaking at a conference, I was asked what my best business decision was. Without hesitation, I said, being born in the United States, or just having the opportunity to live and work in the United States. I was raised to have a pretty good work ethic, and I feel I've been blessed with a reasonable level of intelligence. But there is nowhere else in the world that I could have achieved as much as I did here in America. Anyone who wants to take sole credit for his or her success is myopic. I owe so much to my dedicated coworkers who were educated by the public school system, for a highway system that my trucks drove on, on a military and veterans that protected our freedoms to conduct business, and an economic system that generally encourages and rewards hard work and entrepreneurship. We are still healing from a very contentious election we remain divided in many ways, but our country has gone through challenging times before. Let's hope we can come together as a nation. I truly believe that this nation became the most remarkable one in history, in large part because of its diversity. And any organization's chances of long-term success are enhanced if it has diversity of thinking. In fact, if you have a planning meeting with a group of people and two of them think exactly alike, one of them is not necessary. So much of our country's progress can be traced to creative immigrants in the arts, sciences, education, and business. Yes, there are definitely challenges to diversity. You faced a significant one here just a few months ago. Albright is widely admired because of the prompt and firm action you took, but even more important, is the reinforcement of the va values and principles that guide your family right here. I commend you. One of the remarkable aspects of Berks County is the pervasive culture of volunteerism and charitable giving. And there are national statistics to support that factually. In so many ways, giving back has enhanced my life. First, it makes me feel good to be doing the right thing, which helps others directly or by supporting institutions that help them more directly. Second, it enhances my, my feeling of hope and optimism for the future. Third, it brings me in contact with, and I often have 
the good fortune to become friends with people who are among the finest in our community. And finally, it fulfills one of the tenets of my religion. In Judaism, that is known as tikkun olom, the commandment that we must work to repair the world. I'm confident that your faith encourages similar goals. I encourage you to reward yourself with the pleasure of finding some part of a world that you can help repair. I'm certain that your life will be enhanced as mine has been. I'm fairly confident that while thinking about this day, very few of you gave any thought about this commencement speech. And I'm willing to wager no one gave any thought about James Buchanan. But here's my final shot at a good speech takeaway for you. And Lex, this is where you said the best words are in conclusion. I can say almost in conclusion. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to use James Buchanan to make this point. And it may be the most important thought of the day. Did you know that Buchanan was the only president that never married? So find yourself a good life partner, someone you can come home to, to share your daily travails with, as well as encourage you to pursue your hopes and dreams. But just as important, someone who tell you that your newest great idea is really not so great or that you may be coming a little too full of yourself or taking yourself too seriously, in case you forgot the bobblehead story. I've been fortunate to marry, uh, be married to my college sweetheart, Dina, for 48 years. The best part of my life has related to her, to our three children, and now our six wonderful grandchildren. If Buchanan had my good fortune and he had a Dina, perhaps we could have avoided the Civil War. And by the way, the more successful you are, the more important it is to have someone who is willing to tell you the emperor has no clothes and other truths. The emperor, in my case, later today, I'm likely to hear something supportive like, Vic, you spoke very well, but it was too long. So I'll stop here with the hope that unlike my commencement experience, you may remember one or two things, even if you forget me. I thank you for the courtesy you've extended to me it has been an honor, but mostly I commend you for the efforts that you and your families made to bring you to this day, which has culminated in your educational achievement at Albright. I hope that this is the commencement of many wonderful things in your career and lives to come. Congratulations and good luck to you. Thank you.